Hello everyone. Thank you all so much for joining Birth Institute tonight. We are an international occupational school that promotes midwifery and holistic health. I'm Sierra Brashear, the Director of Student Success here at Birth Institute, as well as editor of Birth Wisdom featuring experts from around the world. For today's event, we are so lucky to have Ryan McAllister here to give us his presentation called Discussing an Elephant in the Hospital, What Practitioners Need to Know About Circumcision. Ryan McAllister is a parent, a biophysicist, an assistant professor of physics and oncology at Georgetown University, and also a volunteer who supports parents and families. Over the last 10 years, he has been studying the medicalization of childbirth in U.S. hospitals and has portrayed his work through projects Unbreaking Birth and Not Just Skin, which you should definitely check out. They're amazing. His work is making an extraordinary impact on the conversation surrounding circumcision, and we are so delighted to have the opportunity to hear from him today. So with that, I would like to welcome Ryan McAllister. Hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Hi. Yes, I'm Ryan. Thank you very much for having me. I'd like to introduce myself by way of my family. This is my partner, Emily, and my daughter, Freya. One of my missions in life is to support the well-being of parents and children. And that is why I'm here talking with you about circumcision. Circumcision is roughly tied for the position of the most prevalent surgery in the U.S. And for something so prevalent, there are a lot of silences. So I'm calling it an elephant in the hospital. Now, before we head into the territory of this elephant, a few things. First, remember, this talk will contain some slides and a short video of graphic material. You are welcome to turn your head at any time. It will also help me if you'll ask clarifying questions during the presentation and save any debate style questions for the end. And a note about terms. I may use the term intact instead of uncircumcised because uncircumcised, to me, euphemistically embeds our bias towards circumcision. It sounds like circumcised in the, is the norm and the uncircumcised person is merely not yet circumcised. To illustrate this, consider how we don't refer to a woman who has two breasts as unmastectomized. I will also frequently use the term genital cutting or genital modification instead of either circumcision or genital mutilation because for me, cutting and modification are more accurate and observation-like terms. Now, Sierra has a short poll so we can learn about where we are as a group. Okay, so um, which of the following child body modifications do you think are ethical? 7% say foot binding is, is unethical, 7% say uh, FGC is unethical, 7% say prophylactic breast bud removal, 14% cutting off non-essential skin, and 29% circumcision. All right, thank you everyone for filling in that poll. So these are all optional things that can be done to minors, most of them surgeries. Let's look at this idea of optional surgery on minors more closely. Healthcare and wellness providers become different things depending on the ethics and intentions by which they practice. So let's look carefully at this question. When do you think a healthcare provider should perform surgery on a young child? We could set the criterion at social conformity. For example, uh, if you were a pediatrician and a person came to you with their child and said, we're going to move to a country where all children have their left earlobes cut off, would you be willing to cut off the child of this earlobe for this parent? We could set the threshold at parental preference. For example, a parent comes to you and says, I'm really uncomfortable with the appearance of my child's nose. I'd like you to make it look more like mine. As a pediatrician, would you do that for, for that parent? We could set the threshold at, to prevent a future potential problem. For example, as a parent, someone might come to you and, said, and say, you know, when I had appendicitis, it was really terrible. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned that my child might get appendicitis. So would you take my young child and prophylactically remove their appendix for me? Would you be comfortable with that? We can also put the threshold at the therapeutic level, meaning that we're only going to do surgery when we, we have an actual, actual existing problem that the child has, for example, a cleft palate or a heart defect. And of course, we can set the threshold that you're never allowed to do surgeries to children ever. And so I've arranged these vertically in order of increasing levels of protection. So let's see what our group thinks about this. All right, so when should a provider perform surgery on a young child? 9% say never, 
87% say to provide a therapeutic intervention, 22% say to prevent a future potential problem, 0% say because of parental preference, and 0% say because of a social conformity. Great, thank you. So of these thresholds, circumcision is typically performed either for social conformity, parental preference, or to prevent a supposed future problem a child might or might not encounter. However, I propose to you that to be safe and reasonable as a society, we need to work at the threshold of only performing surgeries on minors when there is a therapeutic motivation. Otherwise, we allow not just the bizarre sounding examples I gave you a few moments ago, but also a terrifying range of other kinds of child body modifications. And even when we're considering surgery with therapeutic intent, we need to take care. For decades, surgeons have thought they had therapeutic intent when they applied forced gender assignment to children born with visible intersex conditions. But in reality, these surgeons have been and still are doing immense harm to children for the sake of social conformity. We can never escape the fact that we have a lot of responsibility to take care and thought. The difference between providing health care and doing harm is partly in whether or not we are thinking carefully about what we were doing. So when we're doing something with a child, there are a minimum set of people involved. The child, the adult they become, the parent, and the provider. This is part of what makes it such a thorny issue. I think it touches all of us. So before we go on, let's find out how we're ourselves connected to circumcision. So in this poll, 4% have been circumcised. 52% say um, they've been asked to choose for their child. 100% had a circumcised lover, partner, spouse, etc. And 26% have been part of a cultural or religious group. Wow, thank you. And we have a second poll. Part two of the same poll. So 16% say they've performed or assisted. 68 say they've given apparent information about it. 84% say conscientiously objected or opposed it. 68% um, say they've been scolded for opposing it. And 64% felt reluctant to talk about it. Thank you very much for sharing that about yourself. So in this talk, we're going to spend some time exploring the relationship of circumcision to each of these roles, with attention mostly on the part of the discourse that tends to get silenced. So I want to start by focusing on the experience of the child, because to me, it is simultaneously central and yet receives the least attention, especially when circumcision is framed as a choice for parents. Now, it can be hard to look at ourselves accurately. So to help us do that, I want to just take a step back to zoom our perspective out to a larger frame. Let's look at the experience of four different children in four different genital cutting contexts. The images you're about to see aren't graphic per se, the actual circumcisions are occurring off screen. I want to ask you to focus on the faces of the children and your reaction to those faces. So the top left is a young girl being circumcised in her cultural scenario. The bottom left is a young boy being circumcised in his. The top right is an infant boy in his cultural scenario. And the bottom right is an infant boy in the US hospital. Do these expressions on these faces look similar or different to you? What are your reactions, your feelings, and your thoughts to each of them? And I'm asking you just to look at their faces because I think they're having very similar experiences. And yet in our culture, we are very ready to point an outraged finger and say, Oh, these terrible things these people do in other countries where they practice female genital cutting. Yet we're silent about the male genital cutting that occurs to children under similar conditions of hygiene and similar death rates in far more of the world, an elephant in global child rights. And we're supportive of it being done to boys in our country in either a medical context or a religious one, as long as it's a religious one that we're familiar with. So I hear that circumcision isn't like female genital cutting hundreds of times per year. In fact, comparing and contrasting the two is often framed as offensive. So I want to find out, what do you think? So would you be offended if someone suggested that female genital cutting 
and circumcision are in many ways comparable. 8% say yes, 88% say no, and 4% say they're unsure. Thank you. So one thing that concerns me when I hear that circumcision and female genital cutting shouldn't be compared is that I hear it mostly from people who've never experienced female genital cutting and people who have little knowledge of the subject. Um, so we wanted to ask about your, your knowledge about female genital cutting. All right. So what is your experience with FGC? Zero percent who say myself or a loved one have received it. Zero say I've performed it. 38% say I read and studied extensively about it. 62% I've heard of it and know a little. And 3% have never heard of it. Okay, thank you very much. So I would like to, to introduce you to Soraya Murray. She's an activist and producer of the documentary film Fire Eyes about female genital cutting. She's also a survivor of the practice. Here's what she has to say. I am uh, Soraya Murray. I'm from Somalia originally, uh, living in Los Angeles. I'm a human rights activist. The thing that really shocked me when I came to America was the reaction I got when people find out what was happening in Somalia, Sudan, Ethiopia, those parts of the world, Egypt, about female genital mutilations, and people were horrified, they were shocked, they were angered. It, it, it was not even a feminist stand Point, but it was the rights of the child taking her, her humanity and integrity. But the clothes behind closed doors, they were mutilating their own young, you know, boys, sons. And, and it's everyday ritual here, but people don't see it as ritual. But to me, I would see it as ritual because it's the same, same thing. So I believe this procedure, child circumcision, is performed within a fog of language and misperception that makes it hard for us to understand what it really is. One problem is that the person who tells us what the baby's experience is tends not to be the baby. It tends to be the person performing the procedure who is naturally seen as an expert because they've done it many times. Here are some things I've heard practitioners say about circumcision. It doesn't really bother the baby. The pain is over quickly. It's easier when they're younger. And circumcision is very safe. So let's find out. Do you think these things are accurate? So which of these do you think are accurate? We've got zero say it really doesn't bother the baby. 4% think the pain is over quickly. 29% think it's easier when you're younger. 11% think circumcision is very safe. And 68% don't think any of the above are accurate. All right, thank you very much. Now. I will let you decide for yourself as we go forward how accurate you think each of these statements are. I just want to share with you what I have come to believe each one of these statements means. I think that circumcision is very safe means I don't know the risks. I believe that it's easier when they're younger means babies are less able to express their dissent. I believe the pain is over quickly means I don't see the baby afterwards. And I believe it doesn't really bother the baby means I'm unable to perceive the baby's pain. And I want to substantiate those claims and give you a glimpse into the complicated psychology of practicing circumcision. I'm going to show you an excerpt from the documentary film Cut by Eliyahu Ungar Sargon, a Jewish filmmaker and activist. I think Eliyahu has done an amazing job of bringing out the context of circumcision with depth and nuance. The film in whole is available at the website below, and it's not expensive. In this excerpt, you're going to meet a physician in Moyle. She will tell you how she thinks the baby experiences circumcision. Then you will see her perform one in the intimate setting of a family bris. Now, maybe you have performed or attended a circumcision yourself. I'm going to ask you to listen and watch with fresh ears. The goal here is not to understand the technical procedure, which is the focus when being taught it and when performing it. The goal I'd like to ask you to take on here is to listen to the child's experience and note how that relates with the practitioner's framing. None of the techniques are very difficult to learn uh, from a technical point of view, but to me, the dealing with the baby, uh, the, the thing that the baby does not seem to enjoy, it's not 
doing the circumcision itself. It seems to be being mucked with, if you will, uh, just being held down, um, uh, just having their clothes removed. They start to cry as soon as you take their diaper off. One week ago, uh, Aaron and Andy delivered a very beautiful little boy into the world. Um, and today, I help these parents enter their son into the covenant of Abraham. I just need this. Hello, sweetheart. Oh, yes. I'm sorry in advance. Hello, sweetheart. I consider myself especially honored um, because this is the third son in this family for which I've been given this honor. It is a sleepy thing. It's not for long. Okay. I uh, even leave that on, actually. She wanted to. Oh, she did? Okay. Um, no, doesn't matter. Why don't you go ahead and do your job? Give me some uh, good news. We're just getting him in position, that's all. Yeah, yeah wrong way. Yeah, yeah. We gotta cover this up so I don't get squirted here. I gave him his first drink. Actually, I gave him a little bit first. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm down, everybody. The rite of circumcision has been enjoined upon us as a sign of our covenant with God, as it is written. And God said to Abraham, you shall keep my covenant, you and your children after you. He who is eight days old shall be circumcised, every male throughout your generations. We recall the prophetic promise that one day the sign of our covenant with God will be imprinted upon our hearts and the hearts of our children, as well as upon our flesh, so that we may rise to the selfless love of God and therein find life. May we, like our father Abraham, obey the commandment of God, walk before me, and reach for perfection. Joyfully, we present our son for the covenant of circumcision. Good three. Good three. Good three. Good three. You are forever mindful of your covenant, the word you commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant you made with Abraham, which your sworn promise to Isaac, the commitment you made to Jacob, your everlasting covenant with Israel. Oh, we give thanks to the Lord who is good. Put the back of his mouth, just let him suck on it. I know, baby. I'm sorry. Oh, it's not my fault. I'm sorry. Okay, I do need to get over here. <laughs> Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kedoshanu B'mitzvotah B'tzivanu Al Hamila. Blessed is the Lord our God, ruler of the universe, by whose mitzvot we are hallowed, who has given us the mitzvah of circumcision. Baruch Atah Adonai, Asher Kedoshanu B'tzivanu Al Hamila. Abraham Avinu. Amen. Okay. Okay, honey, it's okay. It's okay. I'm all done. Yeah. This may not be the best diapering this kid has ever had, if you can forgive me. <laughs> okay, it's okay. It'll be all fine now. It'll be all fine. Yeah. Okay, it'll be all fine. Okay, okay.
Okay. So I want to encourage anyone who, like me, um, needs to take a deep breath after watching that to go ahead and do so. I uh, I know that was long. I put the whole thing in there because I wanted you to get to see when the baby reacted and all the different things that Dr. Mark said. Um, and I want to ask you to reflect on, on it. What was the child's experience of that? How is it different from what Dr. Marx framed it as? And I also wanted to ask, did you notice that Dr. Marx said, quote, I'm sorry, it's not my fault, I didn't do it. What do you make of this? With the advent of blogs and Facebook, the world of parents has become more transparent in recent years. Here are a few of many examples of things parents have posted about the experience of their child's circumcision. Well, I'm so heartbroken my Tanner got circumcised today and he's still crying and it happened over two hours ago and they made me stay in the room and help comfort him and it was the second most horrific experience in life. I want to ask you, if this is the second most horrific experience in her life, how do you think it ranks in Tanner's? My baby boy just got circumcised. I hate seeing him in so much pain, but that's what's best. Now he will look normal and be accepted. Here, note that the parent's motivation is to make her son look normal and be accepted, and that that makes it okay in her mind to inflict pain upon him. Listening to him cry in pain tears me up inside. Changing his diaper was so hard to do. So it turns out that circumcision is painful for the child for the whole healing process, which usually lasts for about a week. Diaper changes become more complicated with the application of gels or bandages, and you have to watch for hemorrhage or infection. And parents, I think, rarely understand this prior to the procedure. Beyond the pain from the procedure itself and the pain of the many days it takes to heal, there are a number of complications that a genital cutting process puts a child at risk for. You can sort of divide them into two categories, surgical complications, which go from relatively minor, for example, Everyone who has who's been circumcised has a scar. A lot of men don't actually know that the ring around their penis is a circumcision scar, or they learn it at a moment like this. So scarring always happens, but it's often uneven, and the penile skin system itself becomes lopsided. Then there are penile adhesions and skin bridges when the healing process goes awry in two parts of the penis that weren't supposed to be connected and linked together. Lymphedema, which is swelling due to damage to the lymphatic system, and these panels show in the top left, A, a fistula, so it's like a doctor-induced hypospadias. The black line going down is a probe that's entering the meatus, the opening of the, of the urethra, and exiting out the additional hole that the physician has caused. Um, B, top right, is nearly amputated head of the penis. C, so much skin of the penis has been removed that the child's corpus cavernosa and the head of the penis are lodged down inside the scrotum. And in D, the penis was accidentally amputated entirely. There are also a number of post-operative complications. Difficulty breastfeeding, which is important because, de the developing, because developing the ability to breastfeed is essential for infants. Bleeding, which is another sort of minimizing term. You see that on consent forms, you know, like, oh, bleeding. Well, as you probably know, an infant has only about 12 ounces of blood, so bleeding a couple of ounces can lead to the need for a transfusion or even death. The only study to attempt to see if infants' perception of pain was changed because of the experience of genital cutting showed that those babies six months later still had a long-term aggravated response to pain in comparison with intact boys and girls. Meatitis, which is an irritation of the opening, this can also be problematic because if it gets bad enough, the child will not be able to pee and that will require to have, make the child need catheterization. Infection, which can also be very serious in a newborn, especially with drug-resistant infections on the rise. Necrosis, major morbidity. You can find examples of circumcision-induced necrotizing fasciitis, scalded skin syndrome, gangrene, sepsis, and so on in the literature. Permanent loss of the penis and death. So are complications rare? It's hard to figure out how frequently complications occur. Unusually for a surgery, the people who perform it rarely have the responsibility for follow-up care. After a presentation at an ethics conference, for example, one pediatrician told me, I do circumcisions and I have no idea what my complication rate is. How bad is that? 
The people who do take care of complications are pediatric urologists. The DC area has eight of them. One, David Gibbons, wrote that over a two-year period, he had more than 275 children to treat, almost half who required surgery. So they were subjected to an additional surgery in an attempt to correct whatever damage happened. So if Dr. Gibbons' experience is typical, then the DC area had about 500 circumcision complications that were severe enough for additional surgeries in a year. There is something of a quiet, if not a silence, around the pain this causes men. But that silence is there for a number of reasons. One reason I see is that we actively marginalize the voices of men who are unhappy with having been circumcised. We look the other way when the elephant is right there by saying things like, I've never heard a man complain, or I'm circumcised and I'm fine. At the bottom of this screen, you're seeing a grassroots photo project by volunteers and an organization called Intact America. These are men posing with their baby photos under the slogan, I did not consent. I'm showing this to you to contradict the idea that no men mind having been circumcised. These men, and hundreds of men with whom I have personally spoken, do mind. They say things like, it has negatively impacted all of my relationships. It's like I've been raped, sexual abuse. I was just a baby. I couldn't stop them. I can't accept that someone did that to me. And it's not easy to say these things to other people. How easy would, be, would it be for you if your sexuality wasn't working well and you could trace the problem to a commonly accepted cultural practice? And how easy do you think it is with the way our culture projects, projects notions of masculinity to say, my penis isn't working well? One woman with, who I, with whom I was working on an unrelated project knew about my work on circumcision. She thanked me and said, my husband's circumcision was botched horribly. He won't talk with anyone about it. She went on to say that because of the change the procedure had inflicted on his penis, they were not able to engage in traditional intercourse. This is Dustin, a circumcised man in a relationship with an intact man. He says that he can tell the difference between his experience and his partner's. I feel, I feel, feel such a sense of loss, knowing you know exactly what it is that, that was taken from me, and I, and I don't. Know, sometimes it's best not to really focus on, on. I mean, it, it, it's obvious. I mean, I, I'm a male and I'm 30, and my penis doesn't function like it's supposed to, and that's like that's a tremendous injustice, really. It really is. My boyfriend is intact, and I thought that being with a partner who had a an intact foreskin would make me feel somehow a bit better about my own situation, but it it only serves to remind me that that I'm never going to have this experience. But the full video is available on James Lowen's YouTube channel. Um, so the adult foreskin is erogenous tissue. It's about 12 to 15 square inches with 10 to, 10 to 20 thousand nerve endings. It provides mobility to the skin system of the penis and lubrication to sexual activity. The foreskin can be broken down into a few specialized areas. The frenulum is this fanning out region starting from the head of the penis and going down towards the ridge band, which goes around the circumference of the penis. These two areas are where most of the nerves land. And then there's the dartos muscle, which is a cutaneous muscle that extends from the scrotum up to the head of the penis. And it allows the penis, the foreskin to respond to cold or fear by surrounding the penis and pulling it towards the body. In 2007, the first research ever was done to quantitatively assess where the penis is sensitive. Sorrells et al. took a group of circumcised males and a group of intact males and compared the two. On this color graph here, the vertical direction is sensation threshold, with shorter lines being more sensitive, and longer lines requiring more force to be sensed. So the most sensitive regions are the sort of maroon and purple colors down at the bottom. The light gray bars are the intact men, and the dark gray bars are the circumcised men. The horizontal axis is a set of identified regions on the penis. Among the regions I've shown you now, the two are fairly similar. Now let's include the areas that were amputated in the circumcision. You can see that these are the most sensitive regions of these men's penises. If we look at the region around and including the scar, this is where most circumcised men's remaining sensitivity lies, and it's significantly less area and significantly less sensitive than the areas 
that were amputated. You can compare that this way, or you can listen to people like Dustin, who have done the experiment in a sense themselves. So let's map these areas onto images of the penis. Here is the dorsal side of the average of the intact penises in the study, and here's the ventral side. Note the locations of the purple and maroon areas are around the tip of the foreskin and the frenulum and ridge band. Here is the average of the circumcised group. This study allows us to better understand the variation and sensation experienced by circumcised men. Because there is no dotted set of lines in the penis, the operator may amputate this region, or this one, or this one, or a smaller region, or a larger region. Then the penis has to heal, and ultimately, the circumcised individual ends up with whatever sensation has resulted from the combination of their particular starting place, their particular surgery, and their body's ability to heal from it. Now, have you ever seen a penis that was intact? If not, here's the best we can do for a webinar. These lines are drawn on the intact penis to help you see how the skin moves as it is retracted. Watch as the owner pulls it back. I want you to note that the outer foreskin generally surrounds the penis, giving it an enclosure and keeping it moist and soft. So if you compare with a circumcised penis, the intact tissue looks softer, moister, and warmer, in addition to there being a lot more of it. And it doesn't have the scar, which is what those dark arrows show. Many people seem unclear about the mechanical lubrication that I talk about. So this animation is an attempt to help you understand what, how the foreskin moves during sexual activity. Moving along to the parent, I have listened to hundreds of parents. I have talked with many who, when they received their child back from the circumcision, that is the moment at which they understood what they had signed their child up for. There are several problems with informed consent. The information is lacking. What parents hear about it varies widely from practice to practice. And the gravity of the choice they would be making for their child by having him circumcised is not transmitted in how circumcised this circumcision is presented to parents. In fact, it's bizarrely presented as though either circumcising or not circumcising are choices of equal size and weight. I'd like you to hear from this father. So your father that is circumcised with an intact son and a circumcised son. Yes. Do you foresee any problems with that or have you had any problems with that or what's your experience? The only problem that I foresee with it is the apology that I'm going to have to give my, my oldest son. Of course I could go on and say that you know, furthermore, the only thing wrong with it is I didn't do what was right for my first son. And then, you know, if you delve into it deeper, that wasn't done right for me either. Regret, like this father's, is a common theme that I hear. There are even websites and Facebook groups of parents who regret circumcising their children. So I'd like to present to you the idea that by endorsing and offering this procedure, practitioners are also contributing to the suffering of parents. Let's look at the kind of information parents receive about circumcision. Here's what the website of the hospital right next to my university says. Circumcision is considered a very safe procedure. The risks include bleeding, infection, localized redness, and injury to the penis. So I'd like to point out that this language displays a pretense in which cutting and amputating part of the penis is not injuring it. And of course, there is no mention of the sexual function of the foreskin or of the dubious ethics of opting in for an unnecessary, unnecessary surgery on behalf of your child. So how do we get practitioners, who I believe come into medicine wanting to help people performing this procedure? Well, one way we do it is by pathologizing a healthy organ. We teach them only about the disease states of the foreskin. The foreskin itself is largely absent from U.S. medical texts and anatomy books. 
We don't teach students about its function, but we do teach them how to remove it. We further incorrectly teach them the care of the penis, and we present the natural development of the penis and foreskin as a disease state itself, which we misapply the term phimosis to. This is how the foreskin develops. It begins early on as a flap on the penile bud. Well before birth, it grows around the bud and fuses to it. The senitia with which it's attached typically remain attached through childhood to protect the inner skin of the penis from urine and feces in the diaper, as well as abrasion and infection. It is forcibly pulling back this tissue before it's ready that causes pain and infection. At some point, the senitia begin to dissolve, and usually by adulthood, the foreskin is retractile. So let's look at why people say they circumcise. Parents, the most common reason that parents state is to look like others or to look like his dad. The second most common is that it looks better or that it's easier to clean. Parents also cite religious and cultural perspectives that the physician offered it to them, that insurance and Medicaid paid for it. As far as providers go, they say one of the most common things I hear is that they need to offer this service. In addition, I hear to reduce penile cancer rates, to reduce urinary tract infection occurrence, to reduce cervical cancer rates in female partners, and reduce female to male HIV transmission rates. There are significant responses to each of these motivations. Appearance and cleanliness are the number one reason that circumcision is done. Well, that argument is used to support both male and female genital cutting in every culture that I'm aware of that practices either of these. And they aren't just, they are just made up arguments. There is no substantiation to this idea. As far as cervical cancer and female partners is concerned, this is based on a 2002 study that showed that women with intact husbands had higher HPV rates than women with circumcised husbands. As I'm sure you know, cervical cancer is largely caused by HPV, and this was propo the proposed vector in the study. Well, the same authors went back and looked at the husbands and wives in the study, and they found that they had different strains of HPV. So these women did not get HPV or cervical cancer from their intact husbands, but from some source that was uncontrolled in the study. In addition, it's extremely dubious to propose surgery on a baby for the potential benefit of a future partner that that baby may or may not ever come to have. As far as penile cancer is concerned, the American Cancer Society says, no, it won't protect you from penile cancer. It's also irrelevant. The rate is approximately one in 100,000. More people might die from circumcision than from penile cancer. As far as urinary tract infections are concerned, that was based on a big study in 1986 done by a fellow named Wiswell. <laughs> the problem with that study was that his instructions actually caused urinary tract infections selectively in subjects with foreskins because he told parents to forcibly retract the foreskin and wash with soap. So that is just like if you had a little girl and you forcibly douched her. In addition to probably traumatizing her, you would get a higher rate of yeast and urinary tract infections because you've messed up the colonies of, protect, of protective bacteria. In addition, urinary tract infection rates are lower for boys, whether intact or circumcised, than they are for girls. And I really hope that no one is proposing that we perform surgeries on girls to prevent UTIs. Now, the most recent evolution is the proposal of circumcision as an HIV prevention. The evidence for this idea is three randomized control trials. They got volunteer men who were willing to be circumcised, and they randomly circumcised half of them. And they followed the men and measured the rate of HIV acquisition. And the result was that the circumcised group got HIV 60% less often per session of intercourse. Now, the evidence against circumcision as an HIV preventative are problems with the methodology of those studies that I will get into on the next slide, pretty much all other studies that have been done, and the geographic data. If you look at the correlation between circumcision percentage and HIV rates in populations, it contradicts this conclusion. For a particularly poignant example, the United States has the highest HIV rate of any industrialized nation and also has the highest circumcision rate of any industrialized nation. You would expect something different if circumcision were so protective. So let's look at the first of these three randomized control trials. They had both systematic errors and neglected controls. First, 
each time members of either the intervention or control group came to the clinic, the researchers gave them condoms and safe sex counseling. But the circumcised group came at least twice more because they had to come to get circumcised and they had to come for a follow-up. In addition, if you're circumcised, it will take about four to six weeks until you're able to have sex again. And the circumcised group was told to abstain for at least six weeks. But they didn't start the clock until after waiting for six weeks. They started the clock at the beginning. So the circumcised group had six weeks of protection by being unable to have intercourse. In addition, this study used an antibody test, which you know, if you get an STD, if you go to an STD clinic and they use an antibody test, they'll tell you you've got to wait until three months after your last exposure if you really want to know if you have HIV. But again, they didn't start the clock after three months, and most of the benefit occurred during these first three months. Well, half. So those infections likely occurred prior to the start of the trial, prior to the randomization intervention. Now, in addition, there are a lot of problems concerning controls. First, there was a clear need for additional controls indicated by the unusually high 4 to 5 percent rate of acquisition of HIV per, coital per coitus. This means that some of these infections are probably coming from somewhere else. Likely candidates include the uncontrolled blood exposures, dry sex, and receptive anal intercourse. Another worrying indication of the need for controls was the fact that the strongest correlation with HIV infection was visits to a local clinic, indicating that this might be a source of HIV infection itself. And to me, this implies the need for a follow-up study to see if that's true. A lot of these concerns are expressed in a paper that I was part of. Uh, here's the citation for it. And you'll have my email address again at the end if you'd like to get a PDF of it. So I'd like to show you two more clips from Cut. The first shows Eliyahu interviewing his father, who is both involved in his circumcision and is also a physician and an accomplished neurologist. He will speak both to the impact on circumcision, impact of circumcision on the penile nerve system, and to the question of the veracity of health benefits of circumcision. The second speaker, an Orthodox rabbi, will speak about health benefits as a motivator for the procedure. I think all three of these men approach the subject with admirable integrity and nuance. I want to read a quote to you from uh, an article that was published in 1999 in the British Journal of Urology. Histology of the male circumcision scar shows amputation neuromas, Schwann cell proliferation, and the bulbous collection of variably sized neurites. Amputation neuromas do not mediate normal sensation and are notorious for generating pain. Animal studies show that extirpation of the external genitalia results in acute retrograde degeneration of the nerve axon back to the spinal cord. Now what I want to ask you is, as a, a peripheral neurologist, this is your specialty, how do, you, how do you respond to that? How do you feel about that? I feel that that is, um, that this is a surgical procedure um, that what you've just described to me is absolutely um, in sync with any other kind of skin amputation. Um, of course, knowing that there is a high concentration of nerve endings obviously means that there will be more retrograde axonal degeneration. And I'm not going to argue with the fact that it is a, a lesion, a lesion that's made in the skin. Um, that's, that is the, the reality of it, yes. Um, I never ever bought into what we were taught that there was this some there was a health benefit to this. I felt that that was the kind of argument uh, by uh, certain groups that felt that eating kosher was healthy, that uh, circumcision was healthy, that ritual bathing was healthy, uh, separation of men and women during cycle was healthy. I, I felt this was all apologetics. Uh, I never bought into that. It is what it is, and uh, the decision the person has to make is, um, you know, what is the reason that one does rituals, ritual activities? Some of them are painful. Uh, some of them inflict pain on others. It's painful. It's painful.
it's abusive, it's traumatic, and if anybody who's not in a covenant does it, I think they should be put in prison. I don't think anybody has an excuse for mutilating a child, depriving them of their glands, penis, and uh, all. I mean, it's the, you know, we we don't have rights to other people's bodies, and uh, a baby needs to have its rights protected. I think anybody who circumcises a baby, right, is is an abuser. Doesn't matter unless it's like absolutely medically advised because of some complication that a you know, urologist says this baby has to be circumcised. Otherwise, what for? So how does this covenant um, alleviate your ethical responsibility that you just so articulately posed? How, how is it that being in this covenant somehow exempts you from that uh, that term, how, how can you not call yourself an abuser? Just I'm an abuser. I do abusive things because I'm in covenant with God. And ultimately, God owns my morals, he owns my body, um, he owns my past and my future, and that's the meaning of this covenant. That I agreed to uh, ignore the pain um, and the rights and the trauma of my child, um, to be in this covenant. I think that these powerful voices show us that as healthcare providers or advisors, opposing the circumcision of children is not anti-Semitic. In fact, I think openly talking about circumcision and how it is harmful is required of us by at least four responsibilities that practitioners have towards those whom they are serving regardless of the faith or culture of the person whom they're serving. To serve the patient's medical best interest. To serve the patient's desire and needs. To, to accurately and adequately navigate proxy consent. And to accurately and adequately navigate informed consent. And remember that the child is the patient, not the child's parents. As medicine becomes more corporate, the language and philosophy of clients becomes more relevant. However, as with circumcision, when we are performing procedures on one person because of the desires of a client who is an entirely different person, I believe we are deep and dangerous waters and must navigate with the greatest care. Now you may have heard that in 2012, the American Academy of Pediatrics issued a policy statement on circumcision. It said, in brief, Although health benefits are not great enough to recommend routine circumcision for all male newborns, the benefits of circumcision are sufficient to justify access to this procedure for families choosing it and to warrant third-party payment for circumcision of male newborns. Rather than dissect the problems with this statement or guess about its motives, I'd like you to hear directly from a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. You're gonna hear from Dr. Rhoda speaking outside the 2014 AAP conference where he met the Bloodstained Men, a grassroots campaign of people demonstrating against male circumcision. Um, I was uh, uh, walking on the first morning of the meeting towards the convention center and I came across a group of uh, uh, very uh, polite and very uh, passionate uh, uh, protesters. You know, it made me look. Uh, it was a very effective uh, way of getting my attention. Uh, uh, the uh, Bloodstained Men had uh, the passion and the props to, to gather my, my attention. The issue of um, circumcision in children uh, is something that I've always given a lot of thought to by nature of my profession and uh, never really uh, articulated um, externally. I've always kept those thoughts to myself. Um, I was completely unaware that there was a significant movement and that is very well organized and, uh, and very effective um, uh, about that. I am, uh, as a pediatrician and someone who um, works towards the uh, health of children, I am uh, obviously against uh, circumcision, uh, uh, just as I am against any act that uh, inflicts uh, oppression or harm to uh, a, a human being that is incapable of uh, protecting or defending him, uh, himself. So, um, you know, naturally I am against uh, um, the infliction of uh, 
cultural patterns that can harm someone, uh, uh, be that physically or emotionally. I'm against uh, religious practices that can uh, harm someone uh, emotionally or physically, and I am against circumcision. Yeah, that's a procedure that is unnecessary, unjustifiable, uh, and although it has low risk, any risk of an unjustifiable procedure is an unacceptable risk in my mind. And then when I'm put in a position to take care of a child that was perfectly healthy and now needs critical care because of a totally unnecessary procedure, you know, for social convention or religious convention or, or you know, flawed rationale, um, you know, it's it's really heartbreak that particularly, um, you know, hits home. And uh, um, so that's how I come across this world is by seeing the most miserable end of the spectrum, and that just exacerbates, you know, how I feel about that. To, um, you know, put on our societies, uh, such as the American Academy of Pediatrics, to issue strong and relevant statements and not be on the fence about a procedure that has really no medical benefit but has risks, and yet you hedge on very peripheral excuses for not coming out with a strong policy against it. To recap, I believe that practitioners need to know how circumcision can negatively impact all of the people it touches, including them. It threatens the emotional and physical safety of the child. It exposes them to potential pain, loss, and risks. For both the child and the survivor they become, they're living with another person's choice. They have potential emotional consequences, an altered sexual experience. For the parent, they're being put in this position of having to make a false choice because proxy consent is inappropriate for circumcision. They wouldn't want to hurt their children. They may feel regret afterwards. Both parents and the provider are being indoctrinated into an unethical practice. Providers are unaware of complications and other effects, so they're not able to provide full informed consent. Some providers are becoming conscientious objectors because the procedure is not a treatment but it is an unnecessary social surgery. So before I ask you to take action, which I am going to do, I want to acknowledge that there are a lot of challenges in talking about circumcision. Intrapersonally, there is the challenge of our own cognitive dissonance. Interpersonally, there's the strong normativity that circumcision currently holds in our culture, and there's the challenge of potentially evoking and dealing with strong feelings that other people may have about the subject. Institutionally, circumcision is seen as a service, and so there's a lot of institutional pressure to keep providing it. This creates a financial conflict of obligation, and institutions are not very good at navigating financial conflicts of obligation. And of course, this is a long-standing and deeply held religious institution with lots of sensitivity that people have that we need to take care about. And yet, for any particular baby, you may be the only advocate that that baby has. Now, I know I'm asking you to take an active stand against something that you may have been a part of doing or that may have been done to you. I'm aware of how vulnerable that can be. Yet I think this is the task we are called to as an entire society that has been caught up in child body modification, I hope we can find the courage and gentleness to change. We're in a position to protect the children, parents, and practitioners of tomorrow, and I believe it is our responsibility. As I see it, there are many elephants, both inside and outside of the hospital. It is only through talking about and working on them that they change. So let's get these elephants out of our institutions. Here is how to contact me. Thank you very much for taking this issue seriously and for your participation. I think we can open to, to questions now. Is that right, Sierra? Thank you so much, Ryan. I'm sure everyone would be clapping. We could hear them. Maybe they're clapping, but we can't. Um, thank you so much. That was so wonderfully thought out and just beautifully presented. Um, if you all have questions, feel free to type them here into the question pane on your uh, control panel and we'll answer them for you. Okay, just to emphasize at this point, it's fine to say that you didn't believe something I said or to question the accuracy of it or, or for more information as, as well as, as um, clarifying questions. Uh, someone's asking, is there no freezing done to the penis before they are circumcised? 
a number of kinds of anesthesia, some topical things which are usually applied incorrectly and don't work very well. Uh, there's the dorsal penal nerve block, which in theory, at least for the duration of the procedure, can block out the pain, but it's also more risky because you actually have to stick a needle into the, the dorsal nerve of the penis. So you can, there's another set of risks involved and potential damage there. Um, here's another question saying, thank you very much, Ryan. The cutting scene from the movie was so disturbing. The child screaming and the room full of people seemingly completely oblivious to this. Why and how, in your opinion, are human beings capable of this level of detachment from reality? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I maybe have some, some sort of lay answers, but my understanding of, of psychology at that depth is not fully developed yet. Um, you know, I, I certainly think that when something, um, when, we, when we sort of are born into something, we're indoctrinated into it. So whether it's through the medical school practice of everyone seeming fine with it, and so therefore you become fine with it too, or you're, you're born into a culture where something is, is prevalent, I think that naturally um, creates an empathy block. And so it, it takes uh, usually some kind of um, re-engagement to, to awaken the empathy, the empathy around that. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, any suggestions for approaching administrative personnel in a hospital with the information you've presented here? Um, well, you'll get the recording of this, and I also have a sort of more lay audience targeted talk. Um, and I can give you um, almost all the slides. There's only there's only two videos that I don't have permission to share directly. So if you want to present things yourself, and also if you want to correspond with me to try and talk about it. Uh, you know, so I can hear more about the specifics. Um, I'm certainly happy to try and be helpful or be your ally in, in bringing it up. Nice. Uh, it's it's very tricky. <laughs> uh -huh. Definitely. Um, yeah, thank you so much for offering yourself as a resource, Ryan. That's really generous and helpful. Um, okay, another question here. Why do people think that the Plastibel method is a new method? I've heard that it's been around since the 1950s. Is that true? Actually, I don't know when the Plastibel started, um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I've heard of it at least as early as the 80s. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that it's it's being repackaged though for the campaigns in sub-Saharan African countries. You know, USAID and PEPFAR and all these places are the, the Gates Foundation are putting lots of money into um, circumcision campaigns, which I think are possibly going to have terrifying and devastating results because I don't think it's going to have the HIV protection that they imagine it will. But but the idea of like creating a really easy to use uh, technique was has been there's been a lot of funding for that. And so I think on some new forms that are based off the Plastibel um, have have come out from that. So that might be that might be an explanation for what you're seeing. Hmm. Thank you. Um, can you speak to the contraindications of EMLA cream? EMLA cream? Well, I mean, the main problem is that it's not very effective. It's a it's a topical anesthetic. It takes at least um, five minutes to really to really numb something out, and oftentimes people like put it on and then they do the circumcision. And um, so that that's one of the main problems with IC. Of course, I also think that that applying anesthetic doesn't absolve. I just have to say that it doesn't absolve us of of the problems of you know, of circumcision. It will be painful later to the child and we're still, you know, injuring their penis. Right, right. Um, back to the Plastibel, which method of circumcision carries the most risks? I've heard mixed answers between the Mogan clamp and the Plastibel. Um, you know, it's hard to say because because of the lack of follow-up. Um, I think the, the Mogan clamp has the highest chance of like, you know, Cutting off parts that you did that the the operator didn't plan to, and the Plastibel has the most risk of um, causing, uh, you know, problems with the uh, with um, infection and and the the urinary tract. Right. But those are guesses. Just to say, those are guesses. Like I haven't seen a study that could could collab corroborate that that guess there. Great. Thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on our society's hesitancy to admit mistakes? Uh, owning that this is not necessary or beneficial opens care providers up to potential liability. 
How can doctors extract themselves from this yet maintain their personal integrity and financial integrity? Well, yeah, I, that's a that's a great example of a of a fear people have. It's interesting though, the research that I've seen says that people don't sue their physicians when their physicians kindly say they've made a mistake. They sue their physicians when they think their physicians have been hostile or cruel to them. So the vulnerability of admitting a mistake is in a sense a strength. It's um it opens up compassion in the other person and, and helps them see you as human. So I'm I guess I feel hopeful that there won't that you know and I think a lot of the suits occur because people never got to have sort of a reconciliation conversation. You know that there's some in most states I think uh, young men can sue up to two years after the age of majority if they feel like their circumcision was bad for them. And I think one reason they engage in those suits is because they want to stop the practice. So there, it's not as likely in my mind that they would do it if, if a physician was like, you know, I've stopped doing this because I realized it was a, a terrible thing and I'm really sorry that I did it to you and, and they were able to have that sort of reconciliation conversation. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, what do you suggest as a verbal response when parents state that they are going to circumcise their son? And there's a similar question in here. Just what might you say or do when you see a pregnant woman or couple um, or parent with a child in public? So, Ryan, what do you say when, I don't know, you have a pregnant friend <laughs> and you think they might circumcise? Do you have like a spiel? <laughs> yeah, well, you've just seen it. <laughs> <laughs> Set them down in front of their computer. and. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I just start with, are you open to talking about it? Um, yeah. You know, That's or great. or or sometimes I'll put out put a little bit my, more of myself out there. Like, you know, I've spent a lot of time studying and thinking about this, and I've listened to lots of parents about it. And would you be open to hearing what I've learned or something like that? Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's tricky. And with people I don't know in public, I haven't really found anything that seems really effective unless there's at least some like cursory like interaction or relationship I don't know but but you know I'm I was a, a shy nerd when I grew up so I may have more social awkwardness than other people do and <laughs> if you're really good at that maybe you can you know <laughs> somebody else can write us a manual right <laughs> yeah you know, it's, it's a tough conversation yeah and just to acknowledge that like for both pregnant moms and or moms to be whichever you look at it and and for parents like there's a problem that like just lots of people run up to them and want to give them all sorts of advice and stuff. Right. So there's this sea of like bad advice and, and intrusiveness and stuff that it's tricky to figure out how do I not be part of that? Um, Definitely. Yeah, I, I can speak to it as a doula um, on my resources page for my clients. I'm just going to put a link to Ryan's talk. So <laughs> hopefully you. You know, I just offer it as a, you know, op option for them to look into it. And then maybe have a brief conversation about it in prenatals um, just as my way of communicating without kind of crossing that barrier of giving a lot of advice because I know it can be touchy with people. So, um, okay. Will you talk a little bit about men who try to pull or regrow their foreskin and how beneficial that is for grown men? Um. I mean, I don't know. No one's really, there's no systematic study of it. I know that it is a, it's a practice that is based on real phenomena. Like you actually, so skin, grow, when you're a kid, like your skin grows because it's under tension as your bones grow and other things. Um, so it certainly is doable. It, you know, should be done with care because you want to not further injure yourself. And I've heard lots of men say that it was very effective for them, that it, and sort of a range of like how beneficial it was for them either physically and or emotionally. Um, you know, there's something about trying to reclaim uh, a ownership over part of yourself that somebody else did something to. Mm. Um, I don't know how well I'm answering your question, though. <laughs> Feel free to elaborate <laughs> what you'd like to know about if mm. you want. <laughs> um, let me see. So we have a couple of questions in here wanting to know a little bit more about the HIV studies. So are there multiple studies directed toward the topic of HIV and STDs in favor of circumcision that you would recommend looking at, or are there any that have been given more importance than others? Well, pretty much the ones that have been given the most importance have historically ubiquitously been the ones that promote circumcision. And I assume that's because of a uh, 
there's a desire to see what what people want, you know, expect and what validates their position and what they're doing. Um, so I sort of gave you the other side of it, although I did reference the the main ones. Um, yeah. So um, and you you know if you if you have my email address here, so if you want um, me to email you references or things, or the or the critique that I was part of of the HIV ones, I can do that. Awesome. How can we get hospitals to stop soliciting for circumcision? The reason my first son is intact is because he was born premature and no one asked if I wanted him circumcised. I knew nothing about circumcision then and he's now seven and still intact with no problems. He has a baby brother who's intact also because I've educated myself on circumcision since my older son's birth. It would have, uh, it would save so many boys from circumcision if it wasn't solicited. Um, I mean, I think... One door is trying to you know, build a relationship with somebody in the hospital who has some decision-making power. So it sounds like one of the earlier questions, somebody is part of a hospital or works in one or, or knows people in the administration. Um, I think that's, you know, a lot of it's through building relationships, uh, which is very vague. I, I recognize that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I've heard many testimonies of baby's not crying during circumcision. I'd like to think it's called shock. Can you address this? Yeah, I think that's the only only possible explanation. Mm. I mean, you, you know, I mean, the thing, babies are really fragile. You know, you can do something a lot less significant than cut on a baby's skin and elicit crying. And um, I think there's actually two, two possible explanations. One is that the provider just isn't able to hear it. So, for example, I think Dr. Marx showed us that she believed, I think what she said in the beginning is true. She really believes that the baby is upset by the, by being mucked with, as she called it, you know, being held down or whatever, having their legs spread open, which is an uncomfortable position for babies. So I imagine a lot of them don't like that. Um, but she was, was completely unaware when she was talking of the fact that babies cry. You know, you saw, you saw the, the depth of the crying that that, that the baby that she performed the bris on experience. So one explanation is that the practitioner is actually somehow they've gone into a mental space where they're not aware that it's happening or be uh, the other possibility is that the child has gone into shock and is no longer uh, eliciting or, or giving any kind of uh, vocal response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so sad. Okay. I'm going to, try to hand the talking stick over to you, Kayla. I see you have your hand raised, so let's try this out. We've never done it before. Hey. All right, you're unmuted. Kayla, are you there? All right, well, I'm gonna leave her unmuted. Maybe she'll jump on. Um, okay, you presented elephant in the hospital to a college class. Any tips on creating such an opportunity to educate? Well, I've noticed that um, they comment a lot if they haven't circumcised their child that the doctors they go see regularly try to retract. And what would you suggest to um, to these mothers or or going into this situation? So the question is, um, there there's parents who have intact children and their their pediatricians or somebody. I think I missed the beginning. Are are, or attempting uh, to retract, yeah. Or they, you know, I've I've even seen um, moms in in my local groups that have had to write on the child's stomach, you know, do not retract. And I was just wondering what you would suggest uh, for these mothers, or or for me to tell them when I'm working with them, what they should do. Yeah. So if you're if you're working with pediatricians or pediatric nurses who are who have this habit of retracting. I think you have to be really assertive. Um, you can do that through a number of ways. And if I was the parent, I might do all of them. Like I might send a letter to the practice saying like, under no circumstances are you permitted to do this. Then I might bring that letter with me when I had the appointment. And then I would also verbally say it. And, you know, there's a challenge. Like you want, you want like some kind of like information or help from these people. So alienating them too much is hard and they tend to get defensive. Like it, like one of the challenges of healthcare practitioners is they're very busy and they're overstrained. And so anything that like adds another thing for them tends to get them uh, riled up in those circumstances, particularly, especially hospital settings and certain practices that are just very like business-like. Um, 
So you can try to word the letter really friendly like and try to figure out how to assertively but also non-harshly say it. Um, but but that's my recommendation is to say it in multiple ways and or seek a different practice. You know, and you can you can interview practice ahead of time like my child's intact. Does your practice deal with intact children without trying to pull back their foreskins, you know? <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then, then the administrative assistant at the desk is going to be like, uh, I, I don't know. I, I'll have to check. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. Thank right. you, Leah. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, okay, so and back to that other question. You presented on elephant in the hospital to a college class. Any tips on creating such an opportunity to educate? Yeah, so it's that relationship question again. Like you, like I... That, that happened in part because I had already been in correspondence with a professor who was doing work on intersex stuff, and she got asked to do a talk on both circumcision and intersex, and she invited me to tag team it with her. So she did the intersex half, I did the circumcision half. So that, that tends to happen by way of having relationships with, with um, people, and, and particularly in departments that are, you know, amenable. So it might be gender or anthropology or, you know, uh, maybe psychology or sociology as well, um, but but it's hard. It's sort of like but so think about like what relationships you already have. Do you have any relationships with somebody at a university or college near you that you might want to do that, and then ask them if they can connect you to somebody. So go through your network, and if I have any materials that you would like, um, as long as I have permission to share them, you can have all of them. You know, um, it's not. It's not copyrighted or anything, you know. And I've I've benefited from help from tons of people on on making the talks. So it's all you know. We're all working together. So share and share alike. Nice, great. Would you mind touching on the um, psychological damage from circumcision? Are you familiar with the study done by Reinhardt on the psychological effects? Um. Uh, I don't know, actually, even if I'm familiar with Reinhardt. What's, what was the result of that study? I have too many in my, <laughs> my brain. To have them all if you, sorry, I just deleted that question, but if whoever asked that question just wants to raise their hand and they can actually speak to Ryan. Sorry, I don't remember who you are. Okay, there you are. Oh, no, that's Kayla. Where'd you go? Well, anyway, just to answer generically, like there are some surveys that I'm familiar with um, that that look at like, R relative rates of, um, you know, things like anger, depression, difficulty in personal relationships and stuff. And these surveys, which are uncontrolled, unrandom, you know, like there's, they're just surveys, do show a difference. Um, are you there, Ryan? Yeah, yeah, I was just okay. waiting to see. I thought I heard somebody talking really quietly. Oh, no. <laughs> um, are, you, are you done? Yeah, yeah. I, okay, great. great. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, just we have three more questions slash comments in here, and then we'll probably just close it out. So, okay, how do you feel about a practitioner such as a doula or a midwife refusing to work with clients who intend or are committed to circumcising their newborn? Um, how do I feel they should deal with them? Wait, I'm... Yeah, do like, you feel like it's reasonable for doulas or midwives to sort of say, you know what, I don't, I don't think I can work with you because I don't agree with this practice? Um, sure, yeah, you're always at rights to to work with who you feel comfortable working with. Mm -hmm. but, you know, yeah, you're. I mean, no. So there's a there's a dubious there's a situation. So say you're the only midwife, and, and there's no OBs or any other service in a thousand miles and so you're the only person who can help this person if they get into trouble that's when it becomes you know questionable to like deny service but if there are other providers around then I think it's actually a useful and powerful statement to say like to say that this this choice you're making on behalf of your baby I, I think is just wrong and it's not it's not comfortable for me to work with you mm -hmm. you know you can go find someone else that's great Okay, so the last two are sort of just comments. Um, I think this is a rhetorical question, but how is this still legal? After watching the video of the procedure, I'm baffled. So, <laughs> and then we have um, another, Tony says it best, says, thank you, Ryan, let's get this in the history books. So I think that 
wraps up for us. That's all the questions we have. And I just want to say thank you again, Ryan, so much for dedicating such a big part of your life to actually doing this research and presenting it so eloquently um, and making it available to us because it's really, really valuable. And I think if everyone on this uh, webinar goes out and shares this with our clients and our friends and our families, you know, it ripples out. So thank you so much. And thank you everyone so much for being here. Thank you, everybody. And also someone saying, please let everyone know that there's a Facebook group for birth workers called Baby Friendly Doulas. Oh, cool. And, and Summer says, yes, thank you. You've saved many babies. So wonderful. Thank you all. We really appreciate you being here. And look out for more virtual live events um, from Birth Institute via Birth Wisdom. We really look forward to having you again. Have a beautiful evening.